greet you in the name of the risen Christ. Welcome to Dahlonega United Methodist Church. Um, I'm Pastor Steve Schofield, and we're delighted that you've come to worship with us uh, virtually this morning and in your homes, but uh, we're still going to be lifting up the gospel of Jesus Christ and worshiping together on this Ascension Sunday. And uh, as we look forward to the great day of Pentecost, and so we just are, are grateful today that you're here and we want to go to the Lord in prayer at this time. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord of all creation, you whom heaven and earth give testimony to in all that you've made, we come before you in your house, celebrating your holy name and praising you and worshiping you in majesty and awe and in spirit and truth. And so, Lord, fill this house and fill the homes of all those who are watching with your Holy Spirit so that we can be in communion with you and experience your presence with us today. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. is a time in which we prepare our hearts and minds to go before God, to give Him our deepest fears, our greatest hopes, to share our lives with Him, to pray for those who are sick, to pray for ourselves. So join me now as we lift up our hearts to God. Let us pray. Holy God, we thank you for this day. You are Abba, 
Daddy. Father. Dad. Your son Jesus called you Father. And so when he taught us to pray, he said that yes, we too can come to you as a loving father who has great love for his children. Lord, we love you. And we praise you this morning. And now, God, we do. We come to you as your children, sitting with you for just a moment and sharing our lives with you. Because that's all you ask. It's just to abide in you as you abide in us. So Holy Spirit, we ask that you come on each of us now. Empower us with your wisdom. Empower us with your strength. Give us the knowledge that says, my God is real. He is as real as my breath. But He's so much more. You, Lord, are so much more. I call You Lord because You are my Lord. I call You Savior because You are my Savior. I call You friend because You are my friend. And yes, I call You Abba because You are my good, good Father. So I come now. So many needs on my heart, Lord. My Lord, I am crying out to You. Where are You? Please be with me. Don't take Your face away from me. Don't take Your love from me. For your love is all that sustains me. God, we lift up these names to you. Bonnie Weil, Trisha Feinsilver, all of the doctors and nurses, Lord, the paramedics, the mechanics, the technicians, the janitors. All of those, Lord, who are working in our doctor's offices and, and in our hospitals. All of those who are helping those who are sick and ill at this moment, Lord. We lift up Casey Wilson, Anthony Lancaster, Susan Lancaster, Dana Fugero, Daniel Bullenkamp, Jack and Marianne Allred, Susan Hunt. We lift up our GLSEN staff, Lord. Clara Schofield, Belva Howard and Janet Holt, Tony Fay, Daphne Faulkner, Jerry and Harriet Strong, Wendy Jordan, Shirley Sartain, Carol Prescott's brother, Anderson Cox. Lord, in your mercy, hear now the cries of your children. Lord, we know that anything that we ask in Jesus' name, that you hear us. So we ask, Lord, for a miracle today, for healing over the ones whom we have called. We ask for grace so that they may endure the trials that they are facing. Lord, we ask for mercy for us, and yes, for your grace. For we come now, we gather together with all God's children, and we pray this prayer that your Son taught us to pray when he said, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power 
and the glory forever. Amen. Scripture reading this morning comes first from the book of Psalms. Psalm 42, 1 through 5. Hear now the word of God. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Where can I go and meet with God? My tears have been my food day and night, while people say to me all day long, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I used to go to the house of God under the protection of the Mighty One, with shouts of joy and praise among the festive throng. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise Him, my Savior and my God. And then from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 8, starting with verse 22, 22 through 28. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were all saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And He who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Something beautiful, something good. All my confusion, he understood. All I had to offer him was brokenness and strife, but he made something beautiful of my life. If ever were dreams that were lofty and noble, they were my dreams from the start, and the hope for life's best 
for the hopes that I harbored down deep in my heart. But my dreams turned to ashes, my castles all crumbled, my fortune turned to loss. So I wrapped it up in the rags of my life and laid it at the cross. Something beautiful, something good, all my confusion he understood. All I had to offer him was brokenness and strife, but he made something beautiful of my life. Our gospel reading today is from John chapter 20, beginning with verse 24 through 31. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. And though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord, and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in His name. May the Lord add His blessing to the reading of His Word. Let us pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable unto Thee, my Rock and my Redeemer. Lord, we continue to look at hope and how, as your word says, that suffering produces perseverance and perseverance produces character and character produces hope and hope does not disappoint. So Lord, as we fully grasp the living hope that we have in you, we give you thanks in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, we are continuing to look at hope. And we've talked about, uh, we're looking at that period of time in between the resurrection and Pentecost for signs of hope. We live in a time right now in this time of pandemic and our world where we need hope. We need hope more than maybe many of us have ever needed it before. And we've talked in the past about what is hope and where our hope lies and how our hope is in God. And, and, and we've looked at how hope relates to faith. I like to think of it as faith is, is taking that first step out into the abyss, into the unknown. It is faith that allows us to take that step for the Lord. It's faith that allows us to begin that climb up the mountain. But it's hope that tells us that there's victory on the mountaintop. It's the hope, the future and a hope that Lord gives us 
that, that, that drives us and helps us to not have the experience that everyone else is having in a time of crisis. It is hope in, that gives us in a time of crisis strength and purpose and vision. And so we continue to look at hope. And the irony of hope, again, is hope is not seen. It doesn't disappoint, but it's not seen. And when I was a child, um, a young boy, I loved to read stories of seafarers. I, I, I dreamt of, of working on a boat out into the ocean. I loved to, and even those old black and white movies where people were on ships, whether they be old pirate movies like Captain Blood, or whether they be movies like Across the Pacific with Humphrey Bogart where everybody's just going in a ship. I dreamt of that. Uh, the irony is, as I've gotten older, I've, I've gotten where I, I get motion sickness, so the last place I want to be is on a ship in the middle of an ocean when a storm comes. But as a kid, I just, I just, I was fascinated by it, the venture of discovery. And I thought about how brave those first people long before Columbus, long before even maps were drawn, those people, the Vikings, or perhaps even some of the ancient Irish, there's evidence that uh, as, as far back as the eighth century, the Irish voyaged across the Atlantic. Those first people that got into a small boat and went out into the ocean and looked upon the horizon and saw only water and said, we're sailing beyond that. Beyond the horizon. And they're the ones who discovered a new land. Whoever, they're lost in the mists of time, honestly. Whether it be Leif Garretson and the Vikings or the ancient Irish, St. Brennan. You can read about all these ancient seafarers. It, it, it is amazing that they could do that. And I think that's as good an image for me of hope of looking at the horizon and saying, hope says there is a victorious place beyond the horizon. I cannot see it. I haven't been there, but I know it's there. My faith tells me to go and my hope tells me when I arrive, it will be there. And that's what hope is. That's where our hope lies. Always beyond the horizon. As our scripture told us today in Romans, hope is not seen. Nobody hopes for something that they can see. They don't need to. It's there. Hope is always believing and knowing that beyond that horizon, is the desired place, the desired end of the journey that we want to be on. That's hope. And that's what God offers us. Why would the Lord do it that way? Why, why does he promise us that we live in this future and a hope that he makes this promise to us? Why is that so important? How is that edifying to us? How is that practical in our daily lives? Sometimes when we're struggling to see what's going on, where the future lies, when we're struggling, maybe we have issues with our health or issues in our families or issues in the workplace or issues at school and we're struggling, we think, God, why did you make the world this way? Why is it such a struggle? Why can't everything be cut and dried? Why can't everything be clear? Why do we have to look beyond the horizon, Lord? We see our story today from the gospel. After the resurrection, Jesus appears to the disciples several times. 
Thomas is not with them the first time. Thomas shows up. Thomas, he who was so brave with Jesus that when the other disciples didn't want to go anywhere near where Bethany, Thomas was the one that said, let us go and die with him. Thomas was brave. He wasn't a fearful guy. And they said, we've seen the Lord. He is risen. And Thomas said, hmm. Now, wait a minute. I'm going to trust you guys. Last time I saw you guys, you were fleeing from the garden, running for your lives. You, Peter, were telling even young girls that you didn't know who he was and cursing his name. And now you're telling me that I'm supposed to believe you guys? Mm -mm. I got to see this for myself. I often say this, and, I, and I've said this before in my sermons. I think Thomas was the first, well, long before the scientific revolution, Thomas was a thinker, a materialistic, scientific, worldview thinker. He was a very smart man, I believe. If you look at all Thomas, on the interactions of Thomas and the other apostles in scriptures, and Thomas is simply saying, I need to test it. I don't test it, and he had some tests. I, I, I need to touch his hands, I need to touch his side, I need to see him with my eyes. Physical evidence. And if that's true, then I'll believe. Thomas wasn't averse to believing. He just said, I need to, I need to have some proof. You know, we're byproducts of that same uh, scientific revolution I talked about that sort of affects our thinking. We don't even understand how much it affects our thinking. I had to go live in South America and go live uh, and go visit you know, weeks at a time in, in Africa for me to talk to people from those places to recognize how much my thoughts had been shaped by causality, by the, by the understanding of the scientific revolution, by my need to be able to prove the things that, that I affirmed as true. And the, and the difficulty from that is this. There's no place for hope in that scientific materialist worldview. In fact, the, the, the scientific worldview, uh, one of the things that's dogmatic about it, it wouldn't claim to be dogmatic. It would claim to be open to the data. But it is dogmatic because, uh, by and large, they say there's no room for the supernatural or for miracles. Even if we see evidence of them, we're skeptical. There's, that's, that's dogmatically excluded. So a hope based on something beyond what we can see over the horizon, just like Thomas said, I need some proof. I need to be able to see it, touch it, taste it. On the other hand, the life of faith says, I trust in God. Why would God not lay it out for us in such a way that it was readily evident? Why the need for trust? Why the need for hope? Why the need to go beyond the horizon because God has so created us and created the world. If we think about it, that the true strength of a human being comes from things beyond what they can see. Let's look at our current situation, our pandemic that we're in. On the materialistic worldview, we are creatures just of chance, the third rock from the sun in a, 
in a uh, solar system that's part of millions of solar systems, maybe even billions of solar systems, in multi-universes in uh, an ever-expanding cosmos. Time and chance and fate uh, made possible this, and, and, and at any time, this may be destruct, destroyed. And so when we encounter a crisis or a pandemic in our life, we realize our own insignificance from that worldview. I mean, we are just accidents, are we not, in the materialistic worldview? And so everything that we affirm and put any trust in is stuff that we can measure and touch and taste and see. And so in this time of pandemic, knowing that this could be the end and is this the thing that wipes us all out, we're filled with anxiety and fear. How did this happen? Who's to blame? Who's gonna fix this? What are we gonna do? And we even go to work in anxiety and say, we've got to fix it, we've got all this responsibility, we've got to take care of this. Now let's look at, from the other worldview, the worldview of hope beyond the horizon. In that worldview, God created all things. And our world is lovingly and wonderfully made. And the humans in our world are made in God's image. And they're given moral agency. And each one of us is special. And God has created us with a purpose and a hope. And God is sovereign and has a plan. We're not privy to everything in the plan of God but we know God. And so our hope beyond the horizon is not that we understand how everything's gonna work out, but that we know who is working it out. And so we say, along with Paul, all things work together for good for those who know the Lord, who love him and are called according to his purposes. Our hope is in God. And so as the pandemic strikes, we are not filled with anxiety but we turn to the Lord and we look for ways that we can serve Him and love Him and serve others. In our work, we don't sit back, just our hopes in the Lord. We still do the work. We seek to find a vaccine. We seek to, but now it's not out of anxiety that our response, it's all on us to fix this or we're all going to die. No, it's service. Our work is a service to God and to our neighbor. And how different is that attitude with the worldview? Why did God create things so that we can't see beyond the horizon, but our hope is in Him, and our hope is in knowing that the destination beyond the horizon is where we're sailing and we're gonna get there? It's so that we're not anxious about what's beyond the horizon. And it's not all our responsibility to know what's beyond the horizon. Our responsibility is to care for one another on the deck right now as we sail to a place that we know because we know who has that place for us. That's the Lord. Do you understand? That's why Jesus said to Thomas, you see and you've touched and now you believe. That's great, Thomas, but you'll be blessed if you live by faith and hope because you'll have a strength, a strength that will be envied by others who see you. It will be unworldly. It will be a peace that passes all understanding. It will be a way to love and to serve and to live in a, in a time where others can't understand how, because they're losing their minds. Because what this 
pandemic has revealed to all of us is that not only are we not in as much control of our lives as we think, but no one is. Or as the scripture says, don't put your trust in princes or kings where they're just mortals. Why is my soul downcast? Put my hope in God, for I will praise him again in the same. In the sanctuary. You will. You'll praise right here in this sanctuary again. And won't that be a happy day? Won't it be a happy day when we can sit here and sing again without fear in the sanctuary? Why is your soul downcast? Do you not know that? Put your hope in the Lord. I know you long for the Lord as the scripture tells us today. As a deer pants for water. He's right there with you. Put your hope in him. Because I know you remember the day you used to go into the sanctuary. I know you remember the day that you could walk outside without fear or concern. Why is your soul downcast? Put your hope in God. For you again will praise Him in the sanctuary. That's why I strengthen. Look, all the work that we do if we don't understand a disservice, we're ultimately going to be disappointed because all work for glory, for our own glory, for our own, out of our own responsibility is fading. My dad taught me that a long time ago. And my dad loved history and we used to talk about history all the time. And there were certain people we were always fascinated with. And one of his favorites was Winston Churchill. Winston Churchill, the bulldog, the British bulldog, carried his nation through a war that when he became the prime minister, he said, I don't know how we're going to get through this, but I'll tell you what, you're going to get everything I got. Every blood, sweat, tears, that's what I'll bring. Determination. And he did, and he, and he spoke honestly and forcefully and inspiringly to his people. And Perhaps the greatest day of his life was on May 8th, 1945, VE Day, when they celebrated their victory over the Nazi menace in, 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 in Italy and Japan that had engaged and attacked the world in World War II and the, Nazi, and the, and the Brits. Millions thronged London and, and and Winston Churchill stood right next to King George and, and just took it all in. Listen, two months later, on July 5th, he went to a conference outside Berlin, a victory conference. He met with President Harry Truman of the United States and Joseph Stalin of the Soviet Union, the allies who had destroyed and broken uh, the Nazi uprising he had to leave that conference it was going on until august the second as they were negotiating how the negotiated peace he had to go back home on july 26 for an election the students of history you know what happened he was defeated in a landslide He garnered 213 votes and was defeated by almost 200 votes. It was a crushing landslide. He had outlived his usefulness to the British people. And to the surprise of Harry Truman, and Joseph Stalin, the man who returned to finish the conference, was Clement Attlee, the new Prime Minister of Great Britain, of England, who ran on the ticket of the National Health Service. All glory is fading. 
In less than three months' time, Winston Churchill went from the most celebrated Brit of his generation to being escorted out of office. Now, history's treated him kindly, by the way. The BBC, at the turn of the millennium, did a poll on the 100 greatest Britons of all time. They're at the top. Number one, Winston Churchill. But he was long dead by that time. And in his last public act was a concession of defeat. Where does your hope lie? If, it's, if your service, if your work, if your hope lies in what you can do and control with your own hands, you're ultimately going to be defeated. But if your hope lies in the sovereign Lord, if your hope is in God, if you trust in that which you cannot see, you have a strength and a peace to look at the work that you do and the things that are around you, not out of anxiety of how I, I have to control and fix this, but out of how can I serve. I learned this the hard way as my father was becoming more and more gravely ill. As the elder son, I was taking on a lot of emotional responsibility of things I could not control. And I worried and worried. At the same time, the United Methodist Church was having all of its issues and, and it felt like I had no secure ground to stand on. Things that I thought were so solid in my life were all being shaken. And it was getting to me. And I remember one night in my prayer time, just crying out to God. Just crying out. I, I can't do, I don't know what to do, Lord. I don't know how to help my father. My mother's doing all she can, but she needs help. I don't know. I talked to this person and that person, I don't know. And I don't know what to do about our church, the big church. Our church was doing wonderfully, but the big church, I don't, I'm just a peon. I don't have any say, Lord. What? And I'm praying and praying, and God said to me, you dummy. That's literally what he said. I know some people don't like when I use the words dumb or stupid, but I heard God say dummy to me. Turn this over to me. Turn this burden and lay it for me. It's beyond the horizon. You don't, you have, not only can you not see what's going to happen and, and understand, but there's nothing that you can't fix it. You can't control it. There's nothing that you can do in any of these except your service. And you should be doing that with joy. So let that responsibility go and follow me. And I know I should have known that. I've been a Christian all my life. I'm a pastor. I should have known that. But how easy is it to hold on to that which we can't? do anyway and, and, and let that burden just lay on us. And I let that go. And I experienced the peace of Christ. I still had a lot of work to do. I sir, I've had help, work to do helping my father in the church, in, in, in all aspects of my life. But that great burden of personal responsibility, like I had to make, do everything right or the whole thing could collapse 
all around, I let that go and put my hope in God. That's where our strength lies. That's why he created us this way. He knew that as human beings, our temptation, he made us in his image, he gave us a mind, he gave us a will, and he knew the temptation would be that we would take on and carry the burden of responsibility for things far too great. Several times in scripture, people says, People cry out to God and say, I spoke of things too great for me to grasp. Whether it be Job or David or even the Apostle Paul. We have to let go. Paul's conversion, Paul was a deeply, devoutly religious man. He just didn't have that personal relationship with the Lord. And his understanding of morality and religion was he had to control it all. And so God had to come down and grab hold of him and slap him around and say, Paul, wake up. Open your eyes. I'm going to close your eyes so that I can open them. And when I open them, you're going to be a new man because you're going to understand what you don't understand. And Paul was converted to the Lord and understood. And so he could even say, sometimes I don't even know what to pray. I can't see beyond the horizon. I don't know what to pray. But I know this. The same God who made me and who has saved me lives inside me and will pray on my behalf. And beyond that horizon lies victory. Beyond that horizon lies peace. Beyond that horizon is love. It is what God intends for us. And so as we walk through this life, help us to look beyond that horizon. Because if we'll do that, then we'll look at around without anxiety at ways that we can love and serve right now. I'm going to tell you two real quick from our church that have impressed me. Number one, last week, I shared from the scissor lift. It was Youth Sunday, but I shared about CHP and the needs. They weren't able to go out and buy in bulk the food that they needed for the summer feeding program. And I just made a quick announcement before the services by by midweek, I was told that this church responded in such a way of bringing canned foods to CHP that they have all the food they need to begin the summer pro feeding program. Unbelievable. Thank you so much. You thought of ways that you could be a light and serve. Recently, one of our members shared with me that they were looking for a way they could reach out during this time and serve and love. And so they called Jeremiah's place, Fiona there, and said, is there anything I can do? And Fiona said, oh, I'm so glad you called. We have six families here that were in a hard spot, but their lives, they're getting their lives back together. They were working and getting organized and getting, and then the coronavirus hit and everything's been locked down. And it's been very difficult for them. I mean, Jeremiah's Place has extended their stay because of that, but it's, it's tough. It's like they were just getting things in order and then this hit. And so this person from our church said, what can I do? And she said, could you prepare a meal for these six families once a week? So for the last six weeks, this person has been cook going out, getting food, and cooking all day to prepare a feast for the 
families at Jeremiah's place. Because this person's hope is in the Lord and they know he's got this. And so they're looking for ways that they can be of service. That same light shines in you. And it shines in me. Put your hope in Him. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank You so much for this uh, beautiful day. We thank You so much for the, the life that You've given us. Your Word has said that you did so much that the, the whole Word of God can't contain all that you've done, but that which has been written has been written that, so that we may believe and in believing have life in your name. And so, Lord, we thank you for this life. And in this time where so many are living in fear and cannot see beyond the horizon and don't know what they're going to do, Lord, give them hope. Help them to place their hope in you. Take away their anxiety. Open their eyes like you open Paul's so that they can look around and see ways that they can love and serve you and their neighbors. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.